Good morning, everyone. Um, my, my topic for the, this morning's lecture is calculation and socialism. And to start off with, I want to at least point to the article that's probably one of the most important articles written in the 20th century. Um, and that was the article by, von, by Ludwig von Mises, um, Economic Calculation in a Socialist Commonwealth. Okay, so it basically destroyed the intellectual foundations for socialism. And, and I'll get into the background um, in a moment. But it not only did that, it was also sort of a revolutionary breakthrough in understanding the nature and function of, of the price system. Um, it is in the form of a little booklet with an, an epilogue by a notable modern Austrian economist. So I highly recommend that you, you purchase it in the, um, in the bookstore. So socialism started off uh, in the 19th century. And the initial group of socialists, the ones who got the most notoriety, were known as utopian socialists. And some of them were French, and one was British. Charles Fourier, Henri Saint-Simon, and um, Robert Owen. Now, the, the, they had a, s a certain way of approaching the, um, the, the, the publicity or, or the publicizing of socialism. Right? And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. But there was another group later on who reacted against the utopian socialists, in, in fact, gave them their name. And that was Karl Marx and, and his ally and friend, um, and collaborator, Friedrich Engels, okay? And they called themselves the scientific socialists. So they were the ones who, who bestowed the, the name of utopian, on, uh, which was really negative and derogatory, on the earlier socialists. Because the earlier socialists, as we'll see, were, were sort of embarrassing to the socialist cause. Uh, we'll take Charles Fourier, the French utopian socialist, okay? Clearly something's wrong here. I'm, you take a look at him. <laughs> um, Fourier came up with an idea for how human beings and, and, and human life and economic activity should be, should be organized. And he called it the phalanstere or the fa phalanx in, in English, which is the Roman phalanx of 144 soldiers in, in a certain formation. So right away, you can see he's sort of a socialist. He wants to mold human beings according to a certain vision, this vision that he has of of ancient Rome and, 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 and sort of a military formation. And as we go along, you'll see also that, that all of these socialists believe that they have some sort of, they have access to um, a secret intuition, that, that none of us, a secret source of knowledge that none of us have, have access to or possess. They're the ones who, who, are, go, who are going to give us the, the truth and establish how human beings should interact um, in, in economic activity and in, in social activity. So um, in, in Fourier's vision, the, 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 there would be garden cities. They'd be modeled after a kind of a grand hotel, and there'd be 1,500 to 1,600 um, uh, uh, people in, in, in this um, uh, hotel. Uh, again, according to the, sort of a Greek and Roman military formation. Each resident would be able to purchase accommodations according to their income. Um, all residents would be a stockholder in the city. There would be collective production. Everything would be produced collectively. There would be no exchange. Okay? All would share meals in a communal kitchen. Um, so you know, why is this the right way to organize human beings? Well, I mean, he never really tells us. Okay? In fact, he goes on, and, 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 and his vision gets crazier. Um, and the dirty work will all be shared. But the key here is that there's, one, there's really one controlling mind, all right? And there's no exchange. There's no people um, acting according to their own value scales. And this is, uh, he actually drew a picture of it. This is what it would look like, okay? So all human communities would be organized in this way, and people would live in, in, the, in these type of structures. He also built a model of it, all right? And here is one Fallon stair, which is near my home in, in, in New Jersey, um, uh, in Monmouth, New Jersey. It's now abandoned and spooky, and, you know, it's just, it's ugly, okay? It doesn't look like it's fit for human habitation. 
But let's go on. Here were some of his ramblings. Uh, he told us that 19th century France was allegedly in the fifth stage of advancement. Okay, so they passed through different stages, confusion, savagery, patriarchism. Uh, the fourth stage was barbarity. So after, so they were in the fifth stage, according to him, France was in the mid 18th century, uh, 19th century. And after passing through two more stages, it would approach the upward slope of harmony, which is the final stage of utter bliss. So all socialists have this idea that we're moving towards a stage of utter happiness and bliss in which everything will be perfect, in which we'd have a heaven on earth. Um, and that would last for 8,000 years. I mean, how do you know that? How do you know it would last for 8,000 years and not 6,000 or 10,000, okay? But okay, that doesn't matter because eventually history would reverse itself after that 8,000 years and society would regress back to the beginning, okay? Again, there's this secret what we call gnosis or, or secret source of information that, that no one else is really privy to, o only the socialist planner or the socialist visionary. Um, there were some other things that he said, I, they're just too funny to pass up. So he, um, in, in this stage, it'd be six new moons would replace the one in existence. A halo, okay, would, be, would appear around the, the North Pole above it. The seeds would turn to Kool-Aid. I don't think he used some, the word, you know, some kind of word for, for kind of ju fruit juice, Kool-Aid, um, we'll say. All violent and repulsive beasts would be replaced by their opposite. So you'd have an anti-lion and you'd have an, uh, uh, an anti-chicken. The anti-chickens would, would roast themselves and immediately pop into your mouth when you're hungry, okay, anticipate that you're hungry. You could ride the lions and so on. The human lifespan in the harmonic stage would stretch 144 years. Okay, and five fifths of the, everyone's time would be devoted to free love. This is another thing that almost all socialists, or in all socialist visions, okay, okay, and back in the 19th century, they all, for the most part, were males. So you know, this, this whole idea of free love. Okay, so now, the, the classical economists, even even though economic theory hadn't been perfected by then, they, they still knew about supply and demand, and they crushed. The, 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 these plans that were put forth by these utopian socialists. And this is what was embarrassing to, to, to Marx and, and, and Engels later on, and we'll talk about. But, but for, the, for example, the, uh, the basic question was, you know, the incentives. I mean, uh, if everybody gets this, uh, you know, is, 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 is given income and, um, and, 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 and goods and so on according to their needs, okay, if there's no exchange and, and everyone pretty much gets the same thing, or everyone gets things according to, uh, to how, how productive the planner judges that they are, then um, you know, who will take out the garbage under socialism? This was the, the, the question the classical economists posed. Who's going to take out the, the garbage under socialism? Who will do the dirty work? Who will go down in the coal mines and, and do the unhealthy work and, and the dangerous work? Okay? Who will get up early in the morning and, li and literally you know, take out the garbage? Um, this was solved under capitalism, as the classical economists realized, by supply and demand, okay? by, by differentials in wage rates. The dirtier jobs, all other things equal, tended to get paid higher. Okay? Um, but the socialist answer, well, there'll be a new socialist, new socialist man and a new socialist woman. Okay? Um, they were, in fact, feminists, okay, even in the 19th century. Um, and they, they would work for the honor for being honored by the community for their contribution to the welfare of the community. All right. Now, the, on, on economic grounds, the classical economists won the debate, hands down. Um, they embarrassed the socialists. But both groups, both the classical economists and the socialists, did take for granted that socialism could be as productive as capitalism, if not for the incentive problem. Okay. Now that so so that that that's sort of what, what was in the background there, and as we'll see, that's what Mises addressed. Right? The classical economists did see the incentive problem, but that's sort of a practical problem. And the socialists always said, "There's oh, there's different ways of solving it. We could give instead of coins, we could give these these special medals instead of you know money, and and, and that'll be an incentive to work for the community, and so on." All right. So it was, it was lurking there in the background. Uh, Marx had a brilliant polemical ploy, okay? Basically, he said, anyone who talked about socialism was stupid and unscientific and should shut up. And they were just utopians. So he was the one who coined that term. Um, and he said, look, 
Socialism is going to come with the um, inevitability or, uh, of, of, of the laws of nature, or the inexorable laws of nature will bring socialism about. Okay? Socialism will replace capitalism just as capitalism replaced feudalism, just as feudalism replaced the slave societies of Greece and Rome. Um, it's an ever, an ever upward movement towards the final stage of communism, okay, which some people claim that was sort of another stage with Marx. That we had to pass through socialism before we got, we got to communism. Okay. So he said, this is a scientific doctrine to understand that inevitably communism will come and it will be the final stage. And that therefore, if that is the case, it's like arguing about you know, whether it's going to snow tomorrow or not. Okay? If it snows, it, it snows. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 a part, you know, it's dictated by the laws of nature. You, sh you can't argue about the laws of nature. So everyone should just shut up. Okay? He didn't want anybody talking. Anybody who, who tried to discuss what socialism may look like was considered unscientific and utopian and, and crazy like Fourier. Okay. And he said that, in fact, there's nothing we can do to speed it up. Okay? Just as there's nothing that we can do to make rain come sooner. Okay, if there's a drought, well, the laws of nature will dictate when that drought comes to an end. Same thing is true uh, of, of socialism. So um, Mises always pointed out that, that um, Karl Marx um, always focused on capitalism and the contradictions of capitalism. I mean, he never really wrote about socialism, what it would look like. Okay? And, and that was deliberate. So he called his, his work... Is his magnum opus, Das Kapital, capital, okay? Not socialism. He didn't talk about that at all. So that was kind of brilliant. And everybody, you know, trying to escape this label of, of being unscientific uh, kind of became Marxists, okay? Now, they didn't all agree with everything that Marx was saying about capitalism, but they stopped talking about, you see, you see people stopped talking about what socialism would look like in the future. So that's where Mises comes in. Now, Mises claimed that apart from the incentive problem, there was another deeper, more profound problem with socialism. And that was that without a price system, socialism was impossible. So he stated his thesis as follows, okay, he focused on an, uh, a developed industrial economy with very complicated processes of production and many varied capital goods. And he said that a rational allocation of resources, that is using the resources in their most highly valued uses to consumers or even for the planners themselves, requires market prices. But because socialism abolishes property, Okay, and, and you have only one collective or one central planning board owning all of the property or, or determining how it is to be used, all the, all the property, productive property. You could still own your own home, or not even your own home, really. You, you, the clothes on your back, your food, and so on. You could own those types of things. But you couldn't own any of the productive factors. Okay, that, was, that is a definition of socialism. The abolition of, if, if you look at all socialist plans, all of them want to get rid of property. So it's, it's the abolition of, of private property in the means of production, okay, in land, resources, capital goods, and, and um, uh, any other material means of production, okay? The laborer was permitted to own his own labor and, 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 get, and even get paid wages. So Mises' argument was brilliant in its simplicity, okay? He says, number one, socialism abolishes private property in capital goods and, and natural resources. Um, since a socialist state is the owner of all of these material factors of production, these non-human factors of production, they can't be exchanged any longer, okay? Um, without exchange, there can be no market prices. So if, if there's no exchange, if there's this one agency that owns everything, even if, for example, it's everybody's involved in making the decision, even if somehow you, you have a democratic decision-making, okay, about how to use the factors of production, the fact that they're not being exchanged and not being used according to uh, different uh, the, the expectations and, and values of different minds means that you can really never generate any prices. So under socialism, 
because there's no market and no prices, the, the, the state cannot calculate the cost of production. It never knows whether it's using something for a particular purpose that is, that, that is more or less valuable than other purposes that it could be used for. And I'll, I'll give you an example of this in a moment. And so without the calculation of profit and loss, uh, as we have under capitalism, socialist planners cannot know the most valuable use of resources. And therefore, Mises you know, meant this literally, a socialist economy in which you economize resources, you only use them for your, your, your most highly valued uses. A socialist economy is impossible, okay? He wasn't exaggerating. Um, uh, when, when I looked at his argument, I mean, m most, even many Austrians, uh, would say, well, you know, Mises is, is, is exaggerating. In fact, Murray Rothbard wrote me, when he wrote me a, a letter on a, an article I wrote about this, he said, well, even me, he says, even myself, deep down in my own heart, he says, I thought Mises was a little bit, you know, was exaggerating slightly. He says, but now I, I see that, you know, you know, that you have shown that, that me, it was really impossible. Because it destroys the division of labor. There is no more division of labor. You can't determine where people and things that are productive best fit. So, the key to socialism is not a lack of incentives, the fact that you, you, you can't get people to do what you want because you're not giving them the incentive to do those things. It's not a lack of knowledge that you don't know how to produce things technically, or you don't know what people may like, okay, in general, okay. It's the fact that there's a single will acting. So, so I want to read this. Mises, Mises says, the essential mark of socialism is that one will alone acts. It is immaterial whose will it is. It could be just one dictator. It could be a central planning board. It could be everybody voting democratically about how to use things. It doesn't matter. The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. One will alone chooses, decides, directs, acts, gives orders. The distinctive mark of socialism is the oneness and indivisibility of the will directing all production activities within the whole social system. Now, why is that? So important, because when you have one will, you don't have different people with different values interacting on markets to form prices, okay? One will cannot generate a price structure, a price system, which is very, very complicated, okay? One price alone means nothing. You have to have a, a sort of an inter interconnected structure of prices to be meaningful, okay? And those prices have to be able to change relative to one another to show what goods should be produced, what goods should be produced at, at, with a different technology, and what goods shouldn't be produced at all, all right? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. So Mises pointed out that there are three preconditions uh, of, of economic calculation. Private property in all stages of goods, people have to be able to own everything, all kinds of goods, all kinds of capital goods, factories, um, as well as natural resources, coal mines, diamond mines, uh, sources of oil, um, fisheries, and so on. So you have to have private ownership, not only private ownership, but the second point, you need exchange. People have to be permitted to exchange these things with one another so that a market comes into existence and generates prices that can be used for economic calculation. Right. And finally, there has to be a sound money. That is, there has to be a money that it, whose value is not controlled by politicians. Now, socialism abolishes all three of these things, okay? And therefore, it makes economic calculation impossible, and therefore, it makes a rational allocation of resources, rational use of resources, um, impossible. Okay. okay. So let me give you an idea of the calculation problem, a very simple example here. Um, Mises said, look, the planners, you know, they have scientists and engineers that can inform them of all the different ways of producing a given good or all, all the ways of producing different goods. That is, they can know their production function. In economics, a production function is a recipe for how to produce a particular good. Okay? And, and to produce any one good, there are many different recipes, okay, as we'll see. But let's take this recipe for a, 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 a Detroit muscle car, um, a Chevy SS, which is no longer produced, unfortunately. Um, and let's say 
you need so much steel, you need so much machine time, uh, unskilled labor, engineering labor, factory space, kilowatt hours of, of electricity, gallons of paint. Um, notice that all of the units are heterogeneous. You can't add up tons of steel with gallons of paint, with kilowatts of, of hours. Okay? You, you can't know, just from the technical data, which the planners would have, you cannot know the cost of producing this particular automobile. OK, now how is this problem solved under capitalism? It's solved through economic calculation. Um, all of those resources that go into pr the production of that automobile have prices, because they're all exchanged at every moment on the market. So there's always an existing price structure. So if you can, you can conceive of, of producing any good, you can always know its cost of production. As long as you know the production function, you know how much of each, each input is necessary. You can, calculate, you can find out the price of those inputs and calculate the costs. Okay. And because the price structure is ongoing, and because entrepreneurs are always aiming their production towards the future, entrepreneurs will then anticipate what the output price will be, the price of that automobile. And the comparison of the cost of production with the, 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 the price of, of the product itself will allow the entrepreneur to know whether this will result in profits or losses. So in this case, let, let's assume that the car um, uh, has a cost of production, which can be easily calculated, of $50,000. Um, and the firm forecasts that, that consumers will be willing to buy the output that they're going to produce at $55,000 per car. Okay? Over and above all costs, including the opportunity costs of, of the capital they've invested and so on. So that's a $5,000 pure profit. And therefore, that indicates, one, that they will, themselves will benefit, but it also indicates to the economist okay, that society is benefiting, that resources that would have been used to produce household appliances um, and uh, bicycles and other things worth $50,000, because that $50,000 is what the entrepreneurs will bid for those resources. Right? And so if you can get them for 50000 by bidding against these entrepreneurs, and you can use them to produce something for, that's valued by consumers at $55,000, you are using resources that are undervalued and putting them into a higher valued use. Okay? On the other hand, if, if the entrepreneurs anticipate that you know, consumers will only pay $48,000 for this automobile, then they would be wasting resources, and they would be losing some of their capital by investing. So the incentive is tied up with the calculation, okay? The incentive doesn't exist alone, okay? The calculation is the key, right? So, so they will not produce that good. Not only that, um, you know, take, take the simple bumpers. I mean, we used to have steel bumpers, and that looked like the right thing to do, right? To have steel bumpers on automobiles because they're stronger and they withstand um, impact better. But now we have fiberglass bumpers. Why do we have fiberglass bumpers? Because even though fiberglass bumpers are, are, are you know, less, um, stand up less well uh, under impact uh, and crack and so on, calculation in, the calculation is, is such that it, it's worth paying less for the fiberglass bumper and, and taking a slightly lower price for the car than it is for pay, paying for uh, a, a steel bumper. That is, people will, would rather undergo the re repair costs than pay the extra amount for the steel bumper. So every, it's not just that. I mean, every single aspect of any good that's produced is subject to calculation. Airlines compete on literal inches between the, the, the seat and the, the, the seats, OK? So, so um, an airline will, will calculate that an extra inch of room will allow me to charge $10, you know, $10 more for each seat in the airplane, OK? But on the other hand, it will remove two rows of, 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 of seats and then and cause me to have fewer consumers um, you know, paying prices for a particular flight. So bottom line is that even, even, even inches of airline, of, 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 of seat space for people, is subject to calculation. Okay? Everything is. Now, are entrepreneurs always right? No. I mean, a, a GM lost tremendous amounts of money Back, back in the 1980s when Japanese cars were introduced and they didn't downsize their cars. 
um, they, they lost billions of dollars, as an example. Okay? And had the, the, had the Reagan administration not bailed out the automobile industry by limiting, through voluntary export restraints, the amount of, 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 of Japanese cars that were permitted to be exported to the U.S., um, you know, uh, Chrysler would have gone out of business, and, and GM would have been a lot smaller and much more efficient. Okay? Um, so they make mistakes, but the point is they're able to calculate. And they, and they are able to realize that the mistakes that they make and then, then revise their, their anticipations of the future. Okay. Whereas um, the socialist planner doesn't have, have the slightest idea of whether he or she is even making a mistake. So let me go to an example of, of a mistake that no doubt is, is made, was made in the Soviet Union. Um, I have a friend um, uh, that I grew up with uh, who um, actually married a cowboy out, in, a real cowboy out in Montana. Yeah, she's from New Jersey. And so she moved out to Montana and um, lived on a, a ranch. And, and a ranch actually had some working oil wells. They, they discovered oil on the ranch and so on. And um, so they're doing very well. And so one day she called me up and she said, we're, get, we're getting a new house. I said, oh, you're, you're moving out of Montana? She says, she says, no, no, no. She says, you know, we're having the house shipped in. I said, really? She said, yeah. So what, what occurs out there, because there's like 12 people in Montana, right? So the labor force is tiny. So labor is very, very scarce, you know. Uh, yeah, there's a million cows and, uh, yeah, and so on, cattle. But, but labor is very scarce, very high. So, and, and transportation costs, since Montana is a big state, to get, to get a, 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 a construction crew to come to your, your property and build you a new house, very, very expensive. It's actually cheaper, and this is what she did, to have the house built in Nebraska. So she had the house built in a factory in Nebraska um, in modular pieces and then shipped on these huge, those huge wide trucks, wide load trucks, shipped um, 687 miles to uh, Biddle, Montana, where she, where she lives. Um, and it was a big five or six bedroom home, huge home that was, uh, that was not actually her home. It was something like her home, but it wasn't her home. That, that's a module, that was, that was built in pieces, that was put together, okay. So it's cheaper than to have it built with much more capital. That is, in a big factory, that's where they're built, in these huge factories with a lot of machinery and few laborers, and then to, to, to pay for transportation. It's cheaper to do that than to actually have someone come to your property and, and, and you know, it's a construction crew, and build it in the way that we would build it, for example, in the Northeast or even in the Southeast, okay, where labor is much less scarce. Now, how did, how did people figure that out? How did the entrepreneurs in Nebraska know that people in Montana would buy houses in Nebraska and have them shipped? Through prices, okay? Through calculation. Could that ever conceivably happen where there are no prices? Of course not. It, it just sounds so counterintuitive to have a, sh a house shipped 700 miles, okay? So socialism is, 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 is economic chaos and ir irrationality because there is, there is no... Um, Compass. As Mises once pointed out that trying to decide how to, in, in, in a, an economy like we have today in the United States, let's say, where we have a multitude of, of different goods that we could produce and almost an infinite number of ways of producing these goods, literally almost an infinite number of ways of, of producing goods, um, and, and we have all of these different kinds of capital goods in different locations, it's, he, Mises pointed out that it's like a man in the middle of a desert with no compass, okay? He, he, yes, he can purposely go in a certain way and purposely think that he's, he, he's going to uh, achieve his goal of getting out of the desert sooner rather than later, okay? But he, he has no knowledge of, of, of how to do it. If he had a compass, then, then he would have something to give him direction, okay? And that's what the, the price system is in some sense. Okay, I'm going to jump, jump over this. Um, So now let's talk about the former Soviet Union, some of the problems that it ran into. Uh, production in the Soviet Union was done through gross output planning. That is that each industry was given a target of, uh, for example, how many nails it had to produce, how many chandeliers it had to produce, how many yards of women's clothing it had to produce. And these weren't given in value terms, they were given in physical terms, how many tons of nails had to be produced how many yards of women's clothing had to produce, be produced. 
um, how, many, how many chandeliers uh, of a certain size had to be produced. Well, when, when, you, when you have that kind of planning, and, and Ghost Plan is the name of the agent, it was the name of the agency, the, uh, the uh, central planning uh, agency in, in the Soviet Union. Okay? It's very difficult to specify the qualities uh, and varieties of the, of the product. And um, so we had situations where, where women in the Soviet Union were constantly, uh, petite women were constantly complaining because all the clothes were huge. Because that was the easiest way to fill the target of X yards of, of, of cloth made into women's dresses. Also, children's clothing was in scarce supply. Okay? You had a lot of you know, big people's clothing and adults' clothing being produced. Uh, in the case of agriculture, uh, there was a famine in the 1980s in, in the Soviet Union, and yet uh, observers saw that there were just fields of wheat that were not harvested, and there were tractors in those fields of wheat uh, that were just sitting there rusting because there were too many tractors produced and too much, you know, too much wheat planted, but there was not enough gasoline produced and not enough laborers uh, on the farms to produce those to, to use the tractors. They were, all, they were all producing the steel and the tractors that were then rusting in, in the fields. Okay? So it was, it was chaotic. There was also you know, a shortage of housing, but there were a lot of buildings that, that, that were standing empty with, with no, no ro ro roofs on them. And the reason was because the, the firms producing nails um, would only produce very, very large nails because nails were specified in, the target for the amount of nails you had to produce was specified in terms of tons. So small roofing nails were, were not produced in sufficient number, okay? And so it's a, it's a case of mutual lying. Um, the managers of the, of the firms will, will tell the, uh, the, their industry ministers, well, we can only produce X tons of, of, of nails or whatever it might be. Uh, and, and so they, they're, they're, they're low-balling. Right? They're saying that they can actually produce fewer because they know that the, the managers, or, or rather the, the ministers, um, will, will, will tell them whatever they say will in increase that by 20%. Okay? And the ministers know they're lying, so they'll actually increase it by more, which means that then they'll lie even more and, and, and reduce it. So you, you, information, to the extent that it did exist, flowing be, you know, between different firms and the managers and so on, was, was all based on, on lies. Um, and here's an interesting um, cartoon, which I looked for for a long time. That's the Soviet nail, the famous Soviet nail cartoon. And, he, and so that's the manager of the firm telling you know, the, the minister of the industry, um, well, I, uh, comrade, I've met my quota. Okay. And also another famous story was that of um, Khrushchev, the, the, uh, the Soviet dictator, um, in 1956, um, in, 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 in the UN, he made a, a very fiery speech in which he took off his shoe and he banged it on the table and he said to the, um, to the West, he said, we will bury you. And, and he was talking about economics. He meant that we're, we're going to outproduce you, we're going to bury you. And um, so uh, the, the Soviet economists, when they were talking to their Western colleagues, said, yes, we're going to bury you economically, but, and, and the whole world will be socialist, but, but not Hong Kong. We're going to leave Hong Kong so we can see the prices. Because as, as I'll show you in a moment, how did the Soviet Union actually last for 75 years? Was Mises wrong? Was it really possible? Um, in fact, no. Mises pointed out that, that, that a, 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 a state like the Soviet Union could exist. One more, uh, before I get to that, one more uh, example. Um, Khrushchev also once gave a... Um, uh, a speech to the Politburo, the, the, sort of the, the, the chiefs of, of, of the Soviet Union, um, and which he, in which he, he, he began to berate the chandelier industry because the, their chandeliers were so heavy because they were stated in terms of, you know, pounds of chandeliers you have to produce, that they were coming down from the dashes. They were, they were pulling the roofs down on the comrades in the Communist Party and killing them, okay? The people actually were dying from the chandeliers crashing down on, on di dinners and so on. So all of these um, examples went around back back in the uh, eight, in the 1980s. Okay. So um, I just want to talk uh, just a minute or two. Uh, well, actually, before I uh, before I do that, I, I do want to want to mention um, the, the topic that I was about to, to talk about before, which 
Um, oh, yeah, it was um, uh, why did the Soviet Union last for 75 years? Mises pointed out in his original article that a single socialist state in a capitalist world was n no different than uh, the post office, okay? The post office did not really calculate, okay? But they were, they were able to, they, they weren't profit making, let's put it that way. They didn't calculate to make profits, okay, the, the U.S. post office. But they were able to use the, the prices of, of, of the surrounding, of the inputs that they were using because you know, they were, they were an island in the middle of capitalist prices, in the middle of markets. So we had a rough idea of how inefficient or how efficient they were. There, there was a rough idea, okay, how much the taxpayer would have to bail them out by. So we sort, we sort of knew that. And that was Mises' point, that the same thing was true of a single socialist state in, in a capitalist world, or several socialist states. They could always use prices. And in fact, the Soviet Union did use capitalist prices. In fact, it engaged in trade. It sold, it sold you know, coal, electricity, diamonds, gold on capitalist markets. So it had an idea about prices. It also could copy prices that it saw in the world economy. There's a story that, that Red China had, um, in the 50s, ordered a lot of Sears catalogs to get an idea about how to, how to, how to price things. Um, you know, also, in the Soviet Union, there was a system of bribes in which um, firms that maybe had too much wood or uh, not enough n nails may be willing to uh, bribe other firms to s supply the wood by selling them nails. And you sort of got a system of trade going on there, and, and, and there were sort of rough prices. And also, there's a black market. It was a black market in which m money was paid for, for goods and services in the Soviet Union. Now, all, none of these prices were, were, were right, were, were really the correct prices. So the Soviet Union was still um, enormously, enormously inefficient, okay, and eventually did collapse. Okay? So because the prices they were using from other places did not reflect the scarcity conditions in the Soviet Union. Um, there was a period in which there was actual full communism in the Soviet Union, in which prices were, were completely abolished. And that was a period of war communism from 1917 to 1921. During that period, no, the, the plans were not permitted to use prices, um, and so prices were abolished. But what happened was that um, production just, just, the whole productive system more or less fell apart. Uh, and, and, and people, I mean, they didn't even have enough fuel f during the winter to, to keep people warm. So people were breaking up their furniture and, and, and actually setting it on fire to keep warm and actually then taking parts of their, their home apart, okay, yeah, their apartments and so on and burning them. And eventually people had to move out, to the, out of the cities, okay. They were flowing out of the cities into the countryside to forage for food. So socialism kind of threw man and, uh, back back to, to, to the primitive times. I mean, so socialism can work among small groups, small household economies, right? But it can't work in an industrial economy. And so the, so the whole thing f fell apart. The same thing was true with Pol, Pol Pot, the Cambodian dictator in the 1980s, um, in, um, in which he emptied out the cities and, and, and they sort of went just back to the land and, and, and millions of people died, uh, either were murdered or, or died from, um, from starvation. starvation. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the social appraisement process. That's a fancy word or uh, phrase. Mises used it. And all he meant was the process by which the price structure emerges from, uh, spontaneously from a market economy. So if you look in the middle of that diagram, you'll see entrepreneurs, okay? The entrepreneurs are the s s central player in, the, in, in this appraisement process. Now, what, what does it mean to be an appraisement process? Simply that there are prices put on the various resources. Where do those prices come from? Well, the entrepreneurs look forward, okay? So they look up towards the future price of consumer goods at the top of the diagram. They estimate, forecast what these prices will be, and then they know how much they can bid for the factors of production, for the land, labor, and capital goods that they need, okay? And all of that bidding, Okay, in, in the midst of bidding for these things, prices, it's like a big auction, okay? Prices emerge, and then they can calculate the cost of production and compare it to the, 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 the forecast um, prices of the goods. It's not enough just to have the forecast prices of the goods. You have to have someone 
bidding for the resources and bidding intelligently based on prices that they expect. And the prices of consumer goods that they expect are based on prices of, of, of consumer goods in the past. Okay? Even someone like Stephen Jobs that um, came up with the iPhone, um, he had some idea. He, he knew a price. There was no iPhone before, but there were other things like it. There were telephones. There were different ways of communicating. And, he, and so he estimated what consumers would pay to have a mobile phone, a phone which allowed them to, to, you know, to, to, to speak and, and, uh, and, then, and then have a smartphone and so on. He had an idea. There were computers. There were, there were, there were phones. And so he came up with these estimated prices. And then he, he as, as one entrepreneur, bid for the factors that he needed. And he estimated that the, 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 um, the, the cost of production would be less than the iPhone. He was, he was very he was right, and, and he made profits. Okay. Again, a, a planner could never really do that. Okay. All right, let me just quickly go to the um, reactions to this. Okay, so initially when Mises first set forth his argument in this, in this article in 1920, you had some naive Marxist responses. So first they said, well, you know, what, what's the big deal about calculating? Okay, we'll, we'll just calculate in kind. And, and what they meant by that, uh, it was one particular Marxist, Otto Neurath, who um, was, a, was sort of an enemy of Mises. Um, he said, well, we can just calculate costs by adding up goods in their natural units. We'll add tons of steel, kilowatts of electricity, gallons of paint. I mean... The proper response to that is, <laughs> that, I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. You can't add apples and oranges. Okay. Um, the second response, that, and, and by the way, Mises really addressed all of these naive responses in his original article, is that we can calculate with labor hours. Labor hours are homogeneous. Um, and so that we can just add up the labor hours for producing different goods, and we can see what, what the costs of production are. Um, well, labor hours are not homogeneous. Genius, okay. Um, in fact, we, we know that you know the, the the quality of a labor hour of, of someone who's a, a cashier at McDonald's is, differs from that uh, of someone who's a software engineer or a brain surgeon, or 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 even take the same profession, okay. The quality of labor uh, uh, that put forth by let's say LeBron James is, is is much higher quality, much more valuable than the quality of the twelfth man sitting at the end of the bench on an NBA team, okay. Uh, and also, of course, it leaves out the fact that capital and, and natural resources are also scarce and also have to be economized. And that you can't compare even the same labor, same quality labor, if one is working with more capital and more resources. You have to know where the resources, where the, the natural resources and the capital goods should be allocated. And finally, um, the, the so socialist came up with another solution, and that was Let's just tell the managers on the, last, on the first day of socialism, which starts tomorrow, just come in and do the same thing that you're doing, that you've been doing you know, for the past few years. Okay, just, just do the same thing. Okay, if they can do it under capitalism, we can do it under socialism. And um, of course, what's the problem with that? That assumes that there's no change in the world, that technology never changes, never improves that you never run out of resources, natural resources, and then find new sources of resources, new sources of, of natural resources, or, or actually discover um, totally different kinds of natural resources, and that consumer value scales, our values and choices, will ever change, okay? So in a, in a dynamic world, maybe the first few months, socialism would operate efficiently, but over time, as all these, as, as, as capital goods wear out, um, they should be replaced with better and, and different capital goods. In fact, you're just doing the same thing, and, 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 and it's becoming less and less reflective of what should be produced in the economy, and therefore much, much more chaotic and, and, and wasteful. Okay. And last, I'll just give, because I'm running out of time here, um, there were much more sophisticated responses. Uh, and uh, that came forth in the 1930s, which were um, uh, uh, produced by uh, neoclassically trained economists, ma ma mainly British and American economists. Okay, and um, Hayek and uh, Lionel Robbins responded to them and basically said, uh, "Well, yes, these these 
theoretically these solutions could work, but they wouldn't really be practical. Uh, and then, but Mises responded in, in, in a much more um, incisive way. Mises said, look, all of these solutions, having a, a so, social managers pretend that they're earning profits, um, assumes that the market economy is a managerial economy and that the firms will just ex continue to exist and, and try to, to earn profits, whereas, in fact, we want creative destruction, in Schumpeter's terms, okay? The, the, the actual economy is an entrepreneurial economy in which new firms are created, old firms must be destroyed, labor is, is, is moved into to new, new, new occupations and professions, so it, it misses the whole point of a dynamic economy. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.